Hi, I'm Sarah Goodall. I'm the founder and CEO of Tribal Impact. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about how to keep your business connected in a remote working world. Um, Tribal Impact is five years old and we are a completely remote company. We have been uh, since the start. So hopefully some of the tips and tricks I'm going to share with you today will give you a bit of a sneaky peek of behind the scenes about how we operate and what we do and how we do it. Um, just a little bit about me really. First and foremost, I'm a mum of three. I've got three daughters. Um, so the last few weeks has been quite eventful, if you like, in lockdown, uh, trying to do homeschooling and running a business. I'm also a big fan of coffee. If you see on my Twitter account, Instagram account, you'll see lots of coffee art and things like that. I'm a curious marketer by trade. So I've, I've learned how to do marketing and I've always worked in B2B marketing. And I also am a business owner. So I run Tribal and I run it from uh, Portsmouth. So I'm local to this area where this event is uh, being run. Uh, but actually, we deal with global customers. So hopefully, you know, what you're going to learn today is some of the tips and tricks that we use for, for doing that. Now, when I started Tribal, I wrote a blog post years ago, actually, about two years after, about flip-flops and coffee shops. This whole remote working idea uh, is where people think you just like sofa surf from one coffee shop to another and the reality is it really isn't like that at all um yeah it started like that and it was quite fun but you know you soon get fed up with it and uh, one coffee tastes very much like the other coffee and it gets very expensive and it really isn't about you know this ideal sort of remote working sitting in your garden um it's really hard work. And actually, I'd argue it's more hard work because your office and your home life become one place and it becomes quite difficult to sort of uh, divide the two. You know, when do you stop working and when do you start living? And the two become very blurred. And in fact, it's very difficult. You have to start finding boundaries of like, I need to go out and get a walk. I need to go and get some exercise. You have to be quite disciplined about your time. And several years ago, just as we started to grow, uh, my my mentor said to me, Sarah, you know, do you actually really need an office? Do you need the overhead of having an office? What kind of business do you want to grow? You know, do you want to be at the in the future now? Do you want to create a business that's already adopted modern working practices? And that was probably about two or three years ago. And I thought, that's a bit of a bold statement. And then I started looking at things like Buffer, um, What's another one that uh, runs like the Trello? These are businesses that operate. They're quite big businesses, but they operate completely remotely. And now Twitter has actually made an announcement about their entire workforce going remote as well. So I suddenly thought, well, actually, if I don't have the overhead, I don't have the restriction of where I hire talent. Um, this is actually standing quite like a good idea. And not only that, I don't really want to go into an office and sit on a motorway every day. You know, I want to be able to balance my life. And if I want to work in an evening and drop the kids off in the morning and go to nativities, that's the life I would like. And that's the life that I'd like my team to have as well. So, um, so that's what that's the kind of foundation of today's presentation. So what do we do at Tribal? This is what I'm going to cover today. A little bit about what we do, uh, a bit how we structure and operate, and also how we communicate, not only with each other, but also to our customers. So what do we do at Tribal? Well, to give you a bit of a picture, we're all about activating employees on social media. Um, that's because the modern buyer, the digital buyer, They've naturally self-educating themselves, especially in B2B. They don't invite sales teams in to educate them in the traditional tender process and how that used to work. Quite often, people are shortlisting and filtering who they want to work with very early on in their buying process. Um, and as a vendor, you probably wouldn't even realize they're doing that. So we get involved in employee activation on social media. That includes uh, a very popular topic that's out there, social selling. Um, but it's actually much more than that. It's about how you get your experts out there creating great content. It's about how your employee community sort of get out there and create content themselves, but also be part of the brand story. It's how your leaders engage with your employees on social media. So it covers all of that. It's quite a holistic approach. Um, and when you do that well, you actually reach more of your audiences. You have more ears listening on social and you can influence more of the conversations and drive in marketing speak higher conversions on your website because employee driven traffic to your website is more loyal, credible and a better quality than other sources of traffic coming to your website. So um, so this is why we do it. Um, 
And this is what we do. So we activate employees across the entire company. So whether it's leaders, experts, sales teams, marketing teams, or employees, and that that is what we do as a company. Now, how we structure and operate ourselves, I tell you, I, I'd like to recommend a book because I read it a few years ago, a couple of years ago, and it absolutely changed everything for me. As a growing business, um, this book talks about, you know, how you go from this sort of morphing, sort of unstructured startup into something that's a bit more structured and process driven without being too corporate. Um, and I absolutely loved everything about this book. And for me, it's helping us grow and order ourselves and get us ready to grow further. And it's it's just such a clear way of structuring your business um, and involving your employees in the growth of that business, which is something I'm hugely passionate about. Um, so this is a book that sort of grounded us. I'm going to show some templates that we live by, actually, as we move forward. But Traction is the book that probably helped me. And you can find out a bit more about it the link there. How we structure ourselves at Tribal is very simple, actually. So finance, growth, delivery and delight. They're the core pillars of how we operate. Um, finance, you know, we have to understand the financial picture, our health, our survival. It absolutely pivots on it. And the thing that sort of sticks in my head, you know, when most startups fail within the, the first five years of operation, well, I was pretty adamant that finance was going to be a core pillar of our business going forward. Um, growth is quite key. So this is um, how we grow the business, how we target, you know, our ideal customer base, our target personas, how we build content that speaks to their needs, how we stay relevant with the market. That is an absolute core critical pillar for us. It's growth. Um, and the, a lot of people would call sales and marketing. But you see, I, I don't like the idea of having separate sales and marketing. For me, the two, especially in modern buying age, the two are completely aligned. So we call it growth. Um, and then the final pillar is delivery and delight, because ultimately what you know, how slick we are, how efficient we are in delivering um, will provide amazing customer experiences for our customers. And for me, that's where it ties into delight. You know, you can't do one without the other. And delight fuels advocacy, fuels future growth. And so the cycle goes. And um, this is how we simply structure our business. So we have uh, owners within that. Um, and then we, you know, as, a, as an organization, we stay solely focused on the kind of metrics that manage each piece of that. And talking of that, how we do that, we built systems and processes. And again, based on the traction book and the free templates that are available, every two weeks we monitor our company scorecard. So these are key measurements for each of those pillars. So we look at things like cash, we look at forecast, we look at POs in not delivered, we look at um, you know pipeline, we look at growth metrics such as conversations that we've had, conversion ratios, um, all of that kind of thing. Then we also look at delivery and delight. So we obsess over the NPS, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and we look at how we deliver the processes where bill billable hours, we look at our um, contractor network and how well we utilize them. So this is a company scorecard that we've built that we monitor every week, but we talk about it as a, as a company every two weeks. Um, we also have a business plan, which is what you see on the right hand side. And it is no longer than two pages. That's exactly it. Um, you know, the first page is the strategic plan for the year and three years. It's our 10 year, three year and one year, uh, sorry, our 10 year and three year plan on the front page. It's the vision, it's the uh, approach that we're taking. And then the second page is much more around the one year and every quarter we update that. So we look at the quarterly, how we shift as a business. Um, and what we also do is the organizational checkup, which you see at the bottom there. We ask the team, right? We ask our employees, how do you feel we're doing? How are we doing? Are the right people in the right roles? Are we efficient? Have we got the processes? Is the strategy clear? And we do that every quarter. And at every quarter we get to put together as a business and we look at the performance of our business, what I'm noticing in the market, um, where we think we should steer the business as a result of that. And everybody has input to that. And I'm, I'm really quite you know passionate about that that involvement of the team 
Now, I said about this, we obsess over the NPS. We absolutely do. After every service delivery, coaching course that we have, every training workshop that we do, every advocacy program that we run, we obsess over the NPS, right? We Our feedback fuels our growth. And, um, you know, we want the feedback, the good, the bad, the ugly. We want everything um, because that's, that's what propels us to excel next time. Um, so having a good system in place where you're constantly getting that feedback and acting upon it, that's the key. It's not point just having it and patting ourselves on the back. You actually got to do something with it. Um, and so that's why we've built that system in place quite early on. So the NPS score is quite key. And finally, we look at, and I'm going to break this down, people, process and technology is a very common uh, way of appear, how you operate a business, but it truly is actually. And I think as a remote organization, you need to look at these key areas as to how you build that. And I'm going to share some of the tools that we use uh, to operate across this. Now, when it comes to people first, um, you can tell I'm a people person, I think. And I'm, I'm passionate about our employees being part of the story. We're very transparent with all our team um, about the metrics, about where we're at as a business, um, you know, financially. We don't hold anything back. You know, we win together, we lose together, we uh, build together. You know, for me, it's all about that. I've always admired models like John Lewis and Co-op um, where, you know, it's completely inclusive, right? And everybody understands how the business performs. So there's no point in holding things back like that. Um, we also operate in a digital first recruitment though. So referral recruitment is key to us. People refer people in. We're always on the lookout for new talent. We look for the right skills for the right roles. Um, and we lean very much on our foundational values, which we offer to, we call them the F words. Um, and there are a few more that we kind of use sometimes internally, but not not the core ones. Uh, these are the these are our foundational values. And it's not a test, right? We don't have to remember all of them, but we do tend to find that we lean to more to two or three of them uh, individually, which is fine. But this is the core of what we stand for, right? Feedback, finances, fun. I always say focus on the fun, the numbers will come. Flexible working. It's all about the freedom, uh, you know, to manage your own time. Be fearless, right? For me, as a startup, you know, you just have to go for things. And if you want to grow, you've got to take gutsy decisions. You've got to be fearless, but in a in a calculated way, right? You've got to weigh up the risks before you make the decision. When you make the decision, you go for it and um, and focus, you know, optimizing your time around outputs and outcomes. I'm not one for timesheets and clock watching and, oh, you did this, but you didn't do that. You know, that's, I'm, I'm completely... Uh, reliant on the team to manage their own time to deliver what they feel is a value to the business and contribute to our overall growth and and that is hard for some leaders to embrace I get that because especially in traditional agency type businesses where you've got to manage the time but I I kind of believe you know you put good effort in you get good growth out and uh, everybody needs to feel their contribution to the business in that sense um so yeah we do digital first recruitment you know the CV for me is slightly gone away. I don't look for CVs now. I look for digital presence. And that's the first and foremost thing I look for is like, are you doing what you say you do? Are you are you actually actively pra practicing what you preach? Processes is quite key for me. Uh, we made an early decision to invest in a, in a CRM system and a marketing automation system when a lot of businesses probably wouldn't have invested. Um, so I think it was like year two or three for us. I felt like we might as well do it properly now. There's no point in trying to fix it later and just bodge it now. So we invested early on in creating a good system for automation, um, tracking, uh, and wow, am I happy that we did that then because the kind of intelligence that we get now that we can now forecast accurately um, and build upon, you know, we can look at everything. We can look at what's performing well, what's converting well, where where our customers are coming from, how long it takes them, what typical digital buyer behaviors. You know, we properly get under the skin of what, what our customers are doing and our prospects. Um, and it just, you know, we haven't got it all sorted, right? We, in, in fact, probably now we've got too much data, so we don't know what to do with it. But, but we're in a place where I'd rather be flooded in data that I can do something with than have no data and make sort of you know decisions like that so you know a bit sort of finger in the air so I'm you know this is a key investment for us is to get that sorted 
Uh, the next part as well uh, is the processes internally, right? It doesn't stop on the growth stage. It, start, it also happens at the delivery and delight stage. And we use uh, Asana, another cloud-based tool. All of these are because we're all over the place. So um, we don't have anything on premise because we don't have a premise. So, uh, <laughs> but this is Asana. We use this for milestones, projects. We have project templates. Um, we have a few Asana kings and queens within the company that absolutely love this product. Um, but it helps it helps people pick up projects and have visibility of projects. We don't all wander around looking at spreadsheets. You know, it's all very slick and template driven. Um, so we know exactly what where projects are and when and how they're performing. So this, again, was an early investment, but I'm glad that we did it. In terms of technology, um, we use Teams. We're a Microsoft company, uh, but we love Teams as a virtual business, as a remote team. We love a GIF. We rely on having communities internally. We have Gin Club. We have Book Club. We have uh, Pets Corner where everyone shares their dog photos. I've got a cat. I don't have a dog, um, but we have a lot of dog owners. But this is a great opportunity. for. This is where the conversation happens. And we quickly ping each other. It might turn quickly into a phone call. Um, it might then turn into something like a group call. Uh, Teams allows us to be flexible and operate as a remote team really flexibly. It happens on the mobile device as well, which is brilliant. So we can be everywhere and anywhere um, and people can get hold of each other very quickly and easily. Uh, there's no way we couldn't operate without something like this. Um, and some of us use uh, Slack and things like that. Uh, Zoom is obviously our go-to choice of conferencing. Um, and we love this tool. It's so simple and so easy to use. I know there's been a lot of controversy over it over the last few months. And some of our customers are actively moving away from the platform. So that will bring up questions in our head about how we do that too. But Zoom is a super duper platform for hosting webinars for us and conference calls. So with customers. And then from a, an accounting point of view, obviously, we use a cloud tool. Zero is what we lean on. It's got its flaws, but, you know, for us, it works. Um, and we use that for all our financing and accounting. And again, it's it's friendly on the mobile. So we are a mobile first business. You know, we're all over the place. We act, you know, we communicate, we, we look at things, we want to look at data. And so anything that's mobile cloud friendly is good for us. So as a remote team, we lean on cloud tools. How we communicate as a team, well, you know, we're a social tribe. We, we're we social first. We love LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. Um, we're on all of those platforms, us as individuals, but also us as a brand. Um, and we use Twitter mainly for engagement and conversation. This is where, you know, we get breaking news. We look at what's happening. We retweet, we converse, we comment. This is a great place for us to engage with prospects um, and also our customers to say, you know, it's great. We see what you're doing. We love what you're doing. It's a good place to keep up that that conversation, if you like. LinkedIn for us is more about educating our audiences and getting educated and learning um, and also for connecting and building networks. Um, it's not that sort of instant conversational platform, uh, but it is certainly a place where we inform and educate and connect. And this is a place where relationships start and relationships uh, turn into conversations and conversations turn into you know, opportunities. Instagram, we love Instagram because it gives you a behind the scenes look at us and as personalities and people, uh, but us as the brand and how we operate as well. And these, you know, Instagram, I think, as a B2B tool is going to start growing um, and it allows you to show the behind the scenes. But the thing for me, it's got to be authentic. You know, you've got to curate your own content and create your own content. It can't be, uh, you can't just go on to Unsplash and use stock photography. You've got to put a bit of effort in and create uh, authentic uh, conversations with your, with your followers. And that's important because experts and peers are the most credible in your whole audience. You know, when you look at the Edelman Trust Barometer, this is the 2020 survey, Technical experts, academic experts, people like yourself, regular employees, I have all either stayed the same or increased over the last year. They are the most credible source of information about your brand. So unless you activate those employees online, this is where it, it potentially could go wrong. CEO hasn't shifted, but anything to the right of the CEO has either gone down or stayed the same, um, which is not a great message. OK, so now is a good time to invest in authentic brand communication through the voice of your employees. Because at the end of the day, 
I always believe that people do buy from people that they know, like and trust. And it's a scalable way of building personality around your brand. Um, and it's it's an authentic way to put your employees in front of the brand. And I think when you do that, you can communicate in a better way with your team, with that, beyond your team to customers and prospects um, and create more I don't know, personal brand experiences, but in a scalable way. And I think high scale personalization is going to be the thing that we see from this point on and out of this crisis, uh, activating employees and not being afraid to put personality back into the brand is going to be the key to success of recovery of brands going forward. Uh, this is just a little bit about us and who we work with um, and the kind of company we operate across all industries. But the key is really it's we are B2B. Um, and if you want to connect with me, I'd love to, you know, look me up on LinkedIn. Uh, say hi on Twitter, you know, and I'll have a chat with you back. And if you want to see all my uh, photos of bakes and coffee art and all the rest of it, you can follow me on Instagram um, and that's where you'll find me. Thank you so much uh, for watching today. I hope you've learned a little bit about the behind the scenes sneaky peeky of what we do and how we work. Um, if there's any questions, if you want to ask me anything else, please don't hesitate to reach me on one of these channels. Thanks a lot.